All right, well, we want to get started. Uh, we might do a little tag team here in the middle of the discussion uh, with participants on the panel. And I apologize for those that can't see me on this side, but we'll try to lean in and out. But thank you for uh, sticking around. We realize uh, it's late in the afternoon, and I heard Mark Collier a little while ago declare it's time for beer. So that means we're all really dedicated to what we do. So thank you for joining us. We'll, we will hopefully can make it entertaining, and you can help us make it entertaining by asking questions. But uh, we wanted to take time this afternoon to uh, talk about NFE and, and OpenStack combination together um, from a user's perspective, right? So there's been an explosive growth uh, over the past couple of years around this area. And uh, lots of telecoms are, are, as we've seen in, in discussions and keynotes this week, there's lots of telecoms that are doing POCs and deploying op, um, OpenStack with NFV uh, capabilities. Um, and you've seen the names, uh, Orange, Docomo, AT&T, China Mobile are amongst those. And um, so they're in, embracing NFV via open source, right? So combining the, the two open source projects together. And uh, if you're here earlier listening to uh, Heather and Mark, they were discussing uh, how the projects OPNFV and OpenStack are working together. They gave you some examples on that. Um, so we're innovating very rapidly. We're trying to, hey, that was a quick tag team. <laughs> now you see, now you don't. Thanks, Brandon. That was really nice of you to be able to participate. <laughs> Um, so we're working, you know, we're working hard together to try to meet the requirements and accelerate the deployments of NFEs. But we want to talk about with these folks today uh, some of the use cases, the, the emerging use cases, um, talk about the POCs and testing and how they're working with both uh, OP NFE and with uh, OpenStack and what they find is unique with those. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce the panel. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alan Clark. Um, I work in both projects, actually, and have a whole bunch of fun. Uh, so I'm on the board of directors here for the OpenStack Foundation. So I've been in lots of meetings all week. I'm also on the board for OPNFE, um, and I'm learning the ropes there. Uh, so like I say, I get to have a lot of fun. but. Uh, let me go down the line here, and I'll have our, our panelists introduce themselves. And as you do so, I'd like to start with a real basic question. We've seen lots of surveys this week. We've seen lots of data you know, that shows uh, people are adopting OpenStack, and they're adopting NFE, and so particularly with open source. But I'd just like to start with the basic question. From your perspective, why OpenStack? Right? There's lots of alternatives there. Why OpenStack? So, Deng, we go ahead and. All right. Okay. So, uh, my name is Deng Hui. I work for China Mobile. Uh, so, my my role in the company is mostly develop the strategy for the both SD and MV. And um, so, back to the question. I mean, why OpenStack and why OPMV here? I mean, the uh, we started, and I mean, the we we see the. Uh, the promise of the o open stack for the IT industry, and our company see these trends uh, about our future vision, and so the we pro we jointly with other operators to promote the first telecom open source project. That's the OPM fee. Uh, we see the value uh, of the telecom open source. That's the reason we work with OPM fee, and we also. Upstream OpenStack for the um, this kind of private cloud solution for us, and we that's the reason we we are here. We want we want to contribute. We want to get help from the OpenStack and OPM fee. Thank All right, thank you, Ashik. Uh, hi, this is Ashik Khan from Entity Docomo, based in Japan, and I'm responsible for uh, its NFV standardization, NFV open source development, and these days. Uh, working on 5G core network design. Um, I have a very simple answer for why OpenStack. So it was the closest possible cloud management uh, system that uh, fulfills our requirements to uh, telco cloud infrastructure. Oh, very simple, succinct. Okay. <laughs> Thomas? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas Morin. I'm working for Orange. 
Um, I'm focusing on the infrastructure aspects of uh, network virtualization components. And to answer your, your question about OpenStack, I, well, uh, of course, the, the, there are two questions. Why open? Uh, and uh, I've got a, a very specific example to, to explain uh, why we, we choose OpenStack in the early days uh, in the labs, because we, it was in labs first, and I happened to be working in the Orange Labs. Uh, we had uh, specific use cases where we needed to interconnect uh, the, 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 the Orange One uh, with uh, virtualized server virtualization platforms. And we needed to uh, both innovate and uh, try to bring new solutions to uh, uh, incrementally toward something deployable and uh, the, the, the traditional uh, uh, vendors of uh, server, server virtualization solutions were not really that close to uh, being strong on uh, telco needs. Uh, so we wanted to be able to explore these topics by ourselves. So open source was kind of an obvious direction to go. Mm -hmm. And OpenStack, why OpenStack? Well, the, the dynamicity of the community already at the time, back in uh, 2011, 2011, 2012, was uh, the key motivation to, uh, to, uh, to, to look at OpenStack and the, 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 the easiness of uh, uh, prototyping, prototyping in the OpenStack context uh, was, uh, uh, well, the confirmation that it was a good bet. A good bet. Very good. And Toby. Yes. Just in time. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm stuck in traffic. Uh, but yeah, so OpenStack is something that we've been working with in production for about uh, since the January of 2012. At that time, early on, we, we did a whole proof of concept comparing it with CloudStack and Eucalyptus and Nimbus and all of the different tools that were available at that time. Um, and really, in the end, in that particular time, the thing that compelled us was about the just we felt like it was a good foundation to build from to, to we could see it extending and, and growing from where it had started, where the others had a very limited view of what they wanted to do. OpenStack had a very open open mind about how to expand from the beginning. And over time, we've had to revalidate why. I mean, even in the last three months, we've had to, again, answer the question, why are we using OpenStack? And I think this is, it comes down to, in the end, it's really, I think, the replacement for what standards did before. It's created a way for people to make an API and have a vendor ecosystem that can be proprietary and open, all work within the same construct. And we've seen, you know, a storage provisioning API where none would have existed before, and there was no motivation to make one. And now there's, there is one, and the same things are happening in really large scope uh, in, in networking. So, yeah. Thanks, Toby. By the way, if you have questions, we'd love to make this interactive because we could talk all day long. So if you join the mics, uh, if you stand by the mics, and I can see, it's hard to see from the stage unless I go like this but I can see if you stand at the mic. So if you, if you hit the mics, while they're, while they're hitting the mics, I wanna ask a follow-on question. Uh, uh, it was very, thank you, let me, let me do my question, then we'll grab you. So a follow-on to my first question. So you guys have been at this for quite a while. Um, you really are kind of pioneers in this space, right? In pulling OpenStack, and uh, you don't have to sit back down, sorry. Oh, good, okay, that, we'll stay on this topic. So, go, all right. So you guys have been pioneer, are really kind of pioneers in this space, right? And as you said, Toby, um, it's one of those things where you keep having, to, you keep remaking the decision every few months. So, so my question is kind of, you know, what are some of the, um, see, I lost my brain of thought here. So, so what are some of the benefits and what are some of the drawbacks? What are some of the things you've run into? as you've been heading down this space over the last couple of years. Sheikh, you've got the mic. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the benefit is obvious. I think everyone knows that. It's, it's, I mean, it's the availability of the whole ecosystem. OpenStack plays a part, but OpenStack plays a big part. There is other part of, of the ecosystem where you have the orchestrator, you have the VNF manager, and um, as I mentioned before, OpenStack um, satisfied our satisfies our requirements quite well. Uh, so the availability of different open source solution was was 
was one of the driving factors which um, enabled us to take the decision which one we, we take into our commercial system. Uh, the bottlenecks I see at the moment is there are a few gaps in between, let's say, what is, what is required from us or what the uh, standardization organization defined, and uh, in between present uh, OpenStack uh, implementation. But I don't see those as big bottlenecks. Uh, we are trying to fill those out through a PNFB and other means directly going to OpenStack. Uh, so I think uh, we'll fill out those gaps uh, sooner or later. Okay. Yeah, we're going to ask about those gaps here in a minute, but let's go down to... So um, the benefits you have, well, it kind of depends if you ask me uh, as an individual or <laughs> to arrange that or to arrange that. Or, but definitely uh, the, the, the benefits uh, for Orange as a company of us starting early in, uh, I mean, being a pioneer uh, is that, um, well, this is a huge uh, uh, transformation to make. Right. So the earlier the better, and that's a simple answer. Okay. Uh, uh, and the, 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 the drawback you, that you, could, you, can, you can find when you, you, when you are a pioneer is that you, you start using solutions when, when they are early, mm -hmm. so by definition by when they are less mature, and uh, it means that you, you have a, a significant amount of work to do internally uh, to uh, uh, explain properly um, uh, the expectation that people can have to sell the value of open source and of OpenStack, but not oversell it uh, when it has not the required maturity. So, and all this balance has to be preserved so that the, the, the people understand we, what we can do with it, what we can't do, what we will, and what we will be able to do uh, the next year, for instance. Interesting, very interesting. Toby? Sure. So one of the benefits that has been very surprising to me over the last uh, period of time, especially as we focused on NFV, is just uh, really the telcos, there are some places where they, we compete with each other, but for the most part, it's not really overlapping. And so that has presented an opportunity to work together in a way that was much more difficult before. I actually feel like when, when it when any kind of standards work or interfacing work had been done before, it required a lot of negotiation and translation and all this. That's quite a difficult hurdle to get over. But then in the case of code, it's actually kind of becoming a lingua franca, something to bring everybody together in an easy to um, act on way. So it's not only easy to understand, but it's easy to take action and see results. So that, that, that's one benefit is definitely getting help from the other other telcos uh, to make change happen. And uh, in force, it's, you know, multi-trillion dollar business, so it can have a lot of influence. So that part's been good. The drawback, I think, has been, just as kind of I alluded to, is having to constantly uh, kind of resell the concepts over and over and over again uh, to various different communities. And it's, it, it's quite tedious over time. Chang Wei, you got comments to add on this? Right, I think they almost talk about everything, but in the, the last people I'm talking, uh, I see the gap. I mean, I mostly I'm looks like more negative people. I, I see the gap about because we get used to the file nine of the current grade, but I'm seeing today the VNF application, excuse me, <coughs> application developers, they are not ready to cloudify their applications today. Uh, most of them are still using, I mean, just virtualized, but exactly uh, their solution is not really current great yet. I think the, the today OpenStack uh, is very good because everybody support that. Uh, when we talk every VMF um, vendor, they can support it, but we can still see uh, the, the infrastructure cannot give us the current grade capability. Um, we, we have to rely on the VNF application developers, but they are hesitated to change because they are uh, totally in charge or control the layer three, layer four, I mean, the solution today. Um, so I, I see this as a challenge for us, and uh, we, 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 we cannot change the open slack to become the current grade today, um, but we, are, we try to help. We, we try to figure out so which parts we are going to take. We work with VNF application developers, and so we, uh, we work with orchestrator and to help them to understand uh, they cannot necessarily to rely on the OpenStack to provide the category capability. We can still take the path of the 
uh, M3 for the to be the real commercial deployment. So that's what I see. The the either we that is the benefit also the limitation we have to overcome yeah. in the future. Yeah, very good. All right, uh, hang on. Uh, I promised him first. Oh, okay. Oh, you are so gracious. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ashik, I think you talked about um, orchestration on the VNF layer uh, for the NFE, right? So what are, your, what are the challenges you see when you're um, managing the workloads in the day two environment in a hybrid cloud environment? Right, so when I mean, you know, like you are running the v VNF and the workloads are all sitting in the VNF, and if you are um, migrating the workloads between the private cloud to the uh, public cloud, for example, in a hybrid cloud environment, what are the challenges you see with that orchestration tools you are using from the open stack? Good question. Um, <clears throat> at present, um, we have. I mean, I wanted to say it a bit later, but uh, we, have, we did the commercial rollout of multi-vendor virtualized EPC for the first time in the world last month on OpenStack. Nevertheless, OpenStack is the cloud management system for us. It's not doing the orchestration. The orchestration, orchestration. The orchestration, comes, orchestration part comes from, come from a vendor. So, so does the OpenStack part as well. Um, I cannot give you a direct answer to you because we do not have a hybrid cloud implementation at the moment. It's not a public-private cloud mix scenario. Uh, but the challenges I know, we analyze those maybe at some point, not into the distant future, it will be a hybrid cloud. Or you never know, maybe it will be all public cloud. Uh, the challenges are there are some security problems when you handle mobile subscriber data. So you can't really put them unless you secure it and you're 100% sure there won't be any, any data leak, leakage uh, in the public cloud. And there is also, when you look at the telco nodes, mobile core nodes especially, they're, they're um, very resource hungry, heavy duty, high throughput nodes. So at, at the moment, uh, looking at the public clouds, let's say resource availability point of view, we are not very sure whether we want to put our telco nodes in the public cloud. But the challenges is what I have mentioned. Any of the other guys doing uh, hybrid yet? Yeah. yeah, so one of the things we have is a security offering called uh, the network-based firewalls. It's based on network-based firewall. And then we also have this thing we do called NetBond, which helps you to connect your VPN to um, Amazon or IBM Cloud or one of the others. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work on this subject of, of and then also in DirecTV, we have, have aspects that are like this that we use multiple clouds for. So it's something that we're being mindful of is being able to, to um, orchestrate across a multitude of, of clouds. And that's one of the great things about trying to keep things interoperable and standard is to, to make that available. The, the issue though in orchestration, and we're constantly pressing on using and trying to use more of what's in OpenStack with let's say Murano and Mistral and and Tacker and Congress, and those things are evolving, but they don't quite meet our needs yet. And so we have our own uh, work in orchestration that we've done. And that's, I think, probably one of the next steps for us to work on together as an industry is, is around the vision of Mano uh, that's in Etsy and try to really solve for that. Yeah, so I'll be honest, uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist of orchestration, but um, my, my perception is that one of the great challenges around the orchestration, and that's not entirely specific to uh, uh, hybrid cloud use cases, is uh, the diversity of uh, orchestration scenario that you have to uh, cope with, the diversity of, uh, well, VNFs that you have to cope with, and the risk of proliferation of having uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, orchestr orchestration tools to orchestrate. Uh, and that's something that we see. Uh, we see, for now, uh, different orchestration with different capabilities, lots of variety in the devices to, uh, or VNFs to manage, and that's, uh, that's currently a, a, a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Want to add to that, or should we? Yeah, I, okay. Okay. So, yeah, I think orchestration is a very big topic here, but the question mostly goes to the hybrid case. Right? So for the hybrid case, I think the 
we, we, we are taking different products. We, are, we, we thought the telecom integrated cloud, TIC. So in, for China Mobile's case, we built TIC, not hybrid. So that's purpose. We, we have different type of TIC. I mean, the, for the control plane, for the data plane, for the corner side, for the edge side. So we, we have this kind of um, mixed I mean, environment, but it's not hybrid. So frustration, I can talk later, or whatever. Okay. Th thank you. All right, thank you. Now that we've given you your exercise in standing today. <laughs> Finally. So uh, I do business in Asia, and maybe it's a regional issue, but it's not that easy to hire good open stack or open source engineers in that area. So, you know, I totally buy the benefit of NFV, but it's really hard to take advantage of open source in the area. So why not just, you know, buying traditional vendors NFV version of EPC or IMS, or just buy VMware. Uh, we'll pay a bit more CapEx part, but, you know, OPEX or difficulty of finding a good open source or open stack engineers could be avoided. So as part of that question, as you answer that, is this your, is this your first endeavor with open source? So. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you were so succinct. You know, okay. <laughs> uh, so actually, I think you asked a few questions uh, in one shot. Uh, why not? I wouldn't really mention any particular vendor uh, over here. And you don't have to hire open source engineers. That's the beauty of open source. When I started to join open source, from basically OPNFV from one and a half year ago, I didn't believe that. They kind of sold it as it's an organic community. You'll see that you'll get people. I didn't trust it. I didn't believe that, but it happened. So in the community, you have open source developers. If you can convince them about your use case, like the gap I was talking about, mm -hmm. um, they will be more than willing to help. And we got this, that help. We were very successful in one of the OPNFV projects, requirements projects. So, um, so to answer the why, I mean, hiring about open source engineers, in many of the cases, you, you may not have to do that. Uh, for, let's say, EPC nodes, we see that uh, high availability telco nodes, it will still be supplied by vendors. That's why we always talk about, let's say, standards or a de facto implementation like OpenStack to ensure inter interoperability. So the vendors will be supplying the telco nodes, which need to talk to the orchestrator, the virtualized infrastructure manager like, like OpenStack. So um, we are buying vendor products. And uh, the mono stack in the OCOS implementation, it also comes from a vendor, albeit it, it uses open source solutions inside it. So we are not getting into, let's say, vendors ter territory that much, but we're trying to ensure an ecosystem where vendors open source solutions, telecom operators, they can co coexist and all can benefit uh, by ensuring interoperability. If I have answered all your questions. Okay. Yeah, what, what, I, what I would say, would echo what you said, but one, one nuance that I would bring is the fact that uh, um, we really don't have a, a black or white choice between buying a vendor product or uh, having a team of uh, open source developers. Uh, we, and that's a, the, the, really the beauty of open source, as you said, is that we can explore the full range of options, uh, including buying a, a vendor distribution of uh, Linux and OpenStack, uh, deploying a PNFV, or having a DevOps team uh, running a, an OpenStack deployment, plus uh, OpenStack plus an SDM controller, for instance. So we have the choice. And we are in an ecosystem where we have more mastership of the solution we are closer to uh, being able to, uh, to choose and change uh, our decision later. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's um, the, the clear reason to, uh, to not go uh, proprietary. Nevertheless, uh, uh, in a set deployment today, we, we, we are not at a point where we have everything open source. So, so that's also the, the, that's not part of open source. The, the, the fact that we are in, in an ecosystem where there is a reasonable, reasonable amount of uh, interoperability allows us to have a mix of open source and proprietary products, so. Yeah, this is my favorite topic lately because we spend part of the whole why OpenStack 
part of the, th the thing is, is one group within AT&T says, well, we do VMware, and we use X number of people for Y number of dollars, and it's, you know, it's, what, it's less than what it takes you to do this over here right now. So, I mean, it's an, a constant discussion that we have to try to re-rationalize the, the actual dollars. And in that context, I mean, if you really look at it, it is, when, it, when we're talking about vendors, there's support and somebody's got to do the development and pay the ninjas or whatever in Marantz's uh, presentation. <laughs> somebody's got to pay the ninjas the bears. Uh, to, to evolve it. If it's stable code, like uh, I, was, I was saying earlier today, you know, in 1991, we, I used to buy a C compiler from Sun for $20,000. Uh, C compilers have evolved, but should I be paying the 18% maintenance on a C compiler today after 25 years? That's, that doesn't make any sense. And if you look at all the different technologies across the board, you know, oh, as they evolve, I, the license part of it is something that needs to go away and be open. And you just, it's not about cost in the end. If it was just about cost for us, then our businesses would be commoditized and the bits would be corn. Um, it really has to be more about the value added and the generative aspects. And I tell you, I ran, an op I ran a public cloud using VMware for five years. And then I never had the types of discussions and the types of interactions when I did that, as I do now in the OpenStack community, and getting help from such a much broader set of, of, of people. In the end, the development's gonna get done by somebody, and then I think it, for the most part, it happens without you even knowing about it. Very cool. Do you wanna add or should we go on? Okay, I can make it quick. Add, okay. Thank sure. you. So, oh. uh, so firstly, I think it depends on what are you doing. So are you doing a system integrator by yourself or you are relying on the other people? And uh, secondly, I mean, I believe different use case, we have different people. For example, I'm using open daylight for the optical transportation. I mean, dedicated people to do that part. For the uh, EPC or whatever other part, we need other people to do something like that. Then for the open stack, so like China Mobile, we have a couple of hundred people today doing open stack implementation for our private cloud. It's not for MV purpose. For MV purpose, we do, do need, uh, so they, they can do not necessary to develop the, the open stack, the core code, but they are mostly the tools, installations, right? So these are different purpose. Uh, we do hire the people, bunch of them. Um, but for MV case, I think we still are trying the hybrid case, either VMware or open stack. We see both sides uh, has the, the place to use them. OpenStack has a very strong ecosystem, and uh, we, we see the beauty of them. And uh, I think the, uh, it's quite open topic today. We uh, operate, we are decide different use case, different things based on different uh, backgrounds, and pick the different solution for that. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, so uh, I represent a networking vendor. So I find it very incredibly confusing. You know, we have actually delivered uh, DPDK, we have delivered heat templates, things like that to match your network needs. What I want to hear from you, because you guys deploy it at scale, is uh, what do you expect from networking vendors in terms of uh, plugging into this incredibly complex ecosystem? Uh, you know, the top three asks or the top four asks, um, not from an SDN controller perspective, but from a networking vendor perspective, either a load balancer or a firewall or, or anything like that, what would be the top five things you expect uh, a networking vendor to do in order to plug in uh, into your NFE environments? Top five. Top five. Or, or three, whatever. Uh, yeah. A, it works. Yeah, I, I <laughs> B, it scales. <laughs> so, I mean, um, we spend a lot of time on this subject. Um, I'll give you one example and I'll try not to use names. All right, so there was a time when we picked a, one vendor, and uh, this is in the storage realm, and I'll get to why it's related. We picked vendor X. Uh, vendor X had um, claimed that they had very good Cinder integration. Um, and so we, we deployed X in production, or tried to deploy it in production, and then it turned out that it would take four four to five minutes every time we wanted to spin up a new volume. 
It had added a layer of complexity and uh, confusion in the middle between Cinder and the actual provisioning engine, and it, we couldn't make it work any better than that, and that's just not acceptable. So in the end, we ended up switching to vendor Y uh, because their integration with Cinder was, was well thought through, and it, it actually had been tested at scale, and it worked. It just worked, and it worked real time. So I mean, paying attention to the integration with like Cinder or Neutron, and especially with Neutron, and really working with us on that area is probably the most important thing right now. Because if in the end I have a set of APIs that are standard and everybody agrees on, and that's only like 5% of what I use, then I, I haven't gotten a good benefit out of it. I'm back in the vendor lock-in I had before. So that's this, this area of integrating with Neutron and not overextending and not having gone back and refactored and worked with the community to put it into the, into the core is really important. So, I mean, that, that one is very top of mind lately, and Tom and I are spending our time on this subject uh, so lately a lot. So, that's one. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say the exact same thing. Uh, I'm going to say it in a slightly different way just to, uh, for, for the sake of uh, making it uh, even uh, even more important, uh, highlighting the importance, I mean. Uh, we, need, we need vendors to uh, work with us upstream uh, so that we have uh, uh, consistent APIs that we can use through Neutron to, uh, to use whatever implementation is uh, behind or inside Neutron. So that's, uh, that's really uh, uh, a critical thing for us. Um, yeah. Well, my, my replies are usually very short. So. <laughs> Uh, the other thing we need, and it's, it's a bit of a telco requirement, maybe is a very fast uh, failover feature. If, if a switch goes down in, in, the, in the SDN controller or whatever, we need to instantly recover that through a backup path, as an example. So that's the third one, is it? Do you mind me taking the Yeah, sure. Oh, I just want to complete one thing. So we mentioned neutral integration, but we were mentioning orchestration and the, 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 the question of orchestration of VNFs in particular. And this is an area where we have, where we, we have the same, uh, same type of concern. We, we, need, uh, we need early work uh, to, uh, to uh, make sure that we can manage uh, VNFs that do the same thing in a consistent fashion and that the same pattern uh, applies to this context as well. I think you've already three of them already passed. So okay. Fine. <laughs> yeah. So we're down to about five minutes. Um, so let's see. I you were first. Yeah, okay. you were first. Sorry. Scott Fulton from the New Stack. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Dung and Ashik, you both mentioned that there were certain gaps that the current incarnation of OpenStack kind of leaves open. You didn't say there were insurmountable gaps, but they're there. To the extent that you find yourselves having to uh, fill those gaps yourself or to make uh, OpenStack more interoperable with OP and AV, are you concerned that those changes you make won't be things that you can contribute upstream that, could, could, that can contribute to the community at large, that in effect that perhaps you may be forking OpenStack, it would be the worst case scenario, or, or in the moderate case, just changing it to become unsuitable to anyone's needs but yourself? Very good question. Okay. Yeah, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> we will contribute it upstream and we are doing it. And I'll give you an example. Um, we required some failure recovery features from OpenStack. And um, in order to achieve that, we came to OpenFV. We proposed a requirement uh, proposal and OpenFV people, many of them had open source experience. So they helped us develop uh, the pro project proposal itself, which became more, let's say, comprehensible to the open source community. When telco people write specification, they write 10 or 100 pages. But because we tend to see the end-to-end -end view of the whole thing rather than the feature itself in a standalone way. Then um, in OPNFB, through that project, the name of the project is Doctor, as an example, uh, we got uh, people, uh, open source developers on board. They are very good with OpenStack, and uh, we started to submit blueprints to OpenStack. We have already five, six blueprints accepted, merged in the Metagor release, and for especially Nova-related failure recovery for telco nodes, it's almost done. So to answer your questions, uh, Docomo's approach is uh, whatever 
custom built now got to be in upstream as soon as possible. Yeah, upstream is the only way to go uh, apart from uh, tiny uh, uh, bug fixing uh, patches that can be carried uh, and maintained in house for a short time when it makes sense. And if you have the right team to deploy OpenStack in a DevOps fashion, uh, but working upstream is the only way to go. That really is the spirit of a project like OPNV. Uh, where um, all the contributions are, uh, whether in, in upstream projects that are in OpenStack or in other uh, projects, well, for, for instance, OpenV switch, but the, 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 there's no, no point in trying to, uh, to fork. That's certainly not an option. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll reiterate the point about OpenFV, and that's kind of the cool thing about OpenFV, and I'm not sure we even have another th example like it in the so open source world where it, it takes a specific group's requirements and makes sure that uh, the process is flowing. Uh, it's the process of what does the requirement look like, and then how is it tested at the end, but then also what are the integrations needed to make it actually work, and then all of us working together on it. So, and it includes also helping people test it and be aware of what the upstream processes are. So it's, it has quite a lot of good aspects to help us to prevent forking. I, yeah, I, I, gotta give you your turn. I, I don't want to promise because they already promised. So let, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So we don't have so much time. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Um, I have actually two questions, or maybe two and a half. Uh, first one. Uh, early adopters of NFV, and I believe most of you guys uh, fall into this category, uh, either deployed or are currently evaluating orchestration solutions from, uh, from vendors. Uh, as OpenStack recently launched Zatacker, which is uh, OpenStack official solution for uh, orchestration, uh, what are your thoughts regarding uh, using a vendor solution which has been uh, developed uh, in the last maybe couple, few few years or few months, versus uh, waiting for for Tacker to to mature and uh, using it as an alternative, or maybe combining both by maybe pushing your vendors to work with uh, with Tacker. Second question, uh, if we have time for it, uh, do you think that some of the benefits or or concepts of uh, virtualization, such as maybe uh, multi-tenancy? Do they really apply to uh, EPC and IMS VNFs? Do you think that you may have, at one point of time, an MME and maybe a PK2A and PCRF uh, together in the same piece of hardware? Um, that's it. Thank you. Right. So the, I try to answer the question first. And uh, the first thing is about the uh, yes, we, we do. We did uh, the commercial deployment since last year about our small cell gateway and also rich, rich communication systems. That is both virtualized and uh, MV based. Um, so you're asking the, uh, the attacker, I think you are asking the right people. So I'm going to present tomorrow. If you can come 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, ballroom E, you can see I'm going to tell you what is the difference. So I think attacker here is the most targeting enterprise MV. So we are here sitting here, the telecom MV. So what is the difference? You can see my presentation tomorrow. Uh, I forgot his second question, but I will leave the... <laughs> uh, okay, regarding the first one, um, Tacker could be a potential solution, but you've got to think about, let's say, like how we upgrade, how telco operators upgrade their networks. So you have already deployed a mono stack. It's a, it has an orchestrator, it has a cloud management system, and it has the VNF manager and have interfaces among all three of these. So the interfaces are in generally like they are being defined in HCNFV. So for Tacker to replace an already deployed orchestrator, I would suggest to follow what has been defined in the standard. It will be much easier to replace an existing orchestrator if someone wants to replace the orchestrator. But it could be a potential solution. The other one is, is that the answer is simple. PCRF, uh, all PCRF, EPC nodes, the, the target is to have them all on the same cloud. Yeah, so one comment I would make is that uh, Open source is not a religion at, at operators. Like, uh, so uh, when we have to do a deployment now, uh, the, the, exercise, the exercise consists in looking at the different options, including proprietary ones, 
and see what, what will work for us. So, um, and at the same time, since we, we are learning to understand the benefits of open source uh, in different areas incrementally, uh, we also know that uh, typically that's the work uh, that, that, that can be done at, in the labs of uh, different companies. We work upstream uh, to understand what it, w w the majority of the solution and see when it will be applicable to our context. So I wouldn't be able to specifically uh, comment on Tacker because I'm not an orchestration specialist, but uh, uh, basically that, that, that would be part of the, 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 the answer. Um, and the other comment I would make is that, well, the, the title of the panel is uh, Open Source and AV. Uh, it's, it's not OpenStack and NV. And I'm saying that uh, uh, for a set component that you have to deploy in your architecture, um, there is, I think, the, 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 the official component in the OpenStack uh, world that could play this role is not necessarily the choice that we will end, end up making. Maybe we'll use something else that comes from another ecosystem, and it's good. That's the, 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 why the open source ecosystem is sane. So, um, so uh, but I'm not saying anything against Stacker again, but it's really uh, the, the point that the open source offers this diversity, and we want this diversity to, uh, to play uh, and to, for us to give the, all the, the benefits. Yeah, so I'll reiterate what I was saying before about orchestration. I mean, um, one part of it is certainly each VNF showed up with their own orchestration, and we need to consolidate that. The IT world has been working on orchestration and workflow for a long time, and there's a lot of solutions. And the telco people have had a lot of solutions. And I think, as was described before, I mean, Tacker may be a way to solve it, but I would urge the, everyone to work together more on this topic because the risk is that there is essentially 100 IT tools and 100 telco tools and we're in a real mess at the end. Uh, and we can't come to an agreement over something that I would argue is, is not that hard. So uh, or, orchestration, I, would, I hope we can work together to help solve that. And, and then in a way, OpenFV, I think can, be, can help kind of drive that. I mean, it's not really been able, been, willing to make choices about technology, it's left that alone. It's just demonstrating what the goal is, and then people can insert and, as Thomas was saying, whatever open source tool or proprietary tool, as long as the test passed, then we're good. And we can see evolution happen that way. So on orchestration, that's my thing. Then on the, the sharing, I think that's, for us, one of the struggles that we have Certainly the target, as described, has been packing all workloads on one common infrastructure. And we've done an enormous amount of work to flatten the different clouds we have into one to do this. And you know, we are gonna run many of the uh, 3GPP components on the same exact platform. But there is still a hesitancy on our security team's part on certain functions being together. That's a, a simple example is a route reflector or something really integral to our uh, network uh, routing. That is very, if, if that was hacked into and somebody messed with that, very bad things. Uh, and so there is a reluctance in certain spots uh, to, to share uh, hosts. And we're working very hard to solve those, those uh, sort of concerns, add layer, new layers of security, like a simple example is TPM or T TXT from Intel, adding that as a layer of, of hypervisor security. So that's, we're, tr we're uh, the target is clear, and we have a few things we're working to get there. So. All right, thanks, Toby. Yeah, yeah, so the workload packing issue is a valid concern. Uh, definitely, uh, there are, it's a concern that we share. Uh, what I would say that uh, even if we don't put uh, certain workload on shared uh, compute host, we still uh, preserve a large, a large majority of the benefits of uh, having a common uh, 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 cloud. So that's what I would say. All right, let's go on to our last question. We'll yeah, give you the, the honor of being the last one. Thank you. Um, in all your deployments yet and the stuff you get from your vendors, are you just using hot templates right now or have you tried Tosca stuff and VNF descriptors and other stuff, um, keeping with the orchestration theme. <laughs> this is my favorite topic this week because uh, <laughs> you said that several times. Uh, yeah, well, heat top, heat templates. Uh, all right, so I mean, 
one of the things we've been pushing all the VNF vendors toward is to Red Hot template for, for what they want. And that's worked out okay until recently, the, just the complexity of some of these hot templates have been, been daunting. So um, I think one of the issues that you get into, and, it, and we've seen this with Chef and Puppet and other types of intermediate uh, automation mechanisms that are templating, ways of templatizing uh, automation, is that you build up an enormous amount of debt, of, com of complexity debt, and you lose the benefits of it and uh, you know that's something that we're keeping an eye on is are we just a adding another layer of unnecessary abstraction uh, and then having to also then as as you were pointing out have one end of it be tosca and then some subset of it be heat and then you know just having to have multi layers of abstraction all for basically setting up a vm and you know we, there's going to have to be a balance there I will just do a short comment. Uh, Tosca and Heat, uh, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning them. I think it's also worth uh, mentioning uh, uh, Yang based data modeling because it's, uh, uh, it, it's interesting to know that it's, uh, it's an approach that's, uh, uh, having, that has a lot of traction in the telco world. Uh, um, but it's also something that's very, well, kind of alien to the IT world. So uh, we see a kind of um, tension or a question here about um, what we will end up doing and uh, which teams will learn it and use it efficiently. So there are lots of questions related to, uh, to this. Uh, so the present implementation is a bit proprietary and uh, we are actually kind of looking forward to the VNFD being defined in HCNFV and uh, at the moment uh, we are kind of implementation agnostic on that but hopefully we'll look forward to an open source solution on that as well. Okay, so because it's the last question, let me make it the last comment. <laughs> so the, yes, yeah, so the, uh, if you look at the orchestration layers, so the, from the top to down, uh, whether you go through the heat, if you go to the heat, you have the translation to the hot template, right? So for them the top, you have to have Tosca uh, input for the VFD, I mean, um, we have onboarding, then you have catalog about the modeling in second. Then you have the core modeling. That's very important. So you, it depends on implementation. But after that, you, then you need to decouple the VNF with the connections. For the connections, you go to the uh, young modeling for the network connections. And you can toss card for the lifecycle manager. We have descriptions. So that's where the layers that's already been implemented by people. I think uh, Open Australia is also doing these things. Uh, by open source and kind of standard uh, data modeling. Open orchestrator tomorrow, yeah. Nightcloud, borrow me. I'm making advertisement, okay. Yeah, you're, you're good at this, you know. Okay. Any other announcements you want? No. <laughs> thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, that was fun, the, especially having the audience participate and we didn't have to dream up the questions. Um, thank you to the panelists, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, and Anyway, thank you. We're standing between you and beer. So have a good evening.